Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez. Uh, and today, uh, both myself and Ricardo are interviewing Nicholas Gregory, a man with many talents, uh, as you can see from his Twitter bio, uh, and the man behind Commerce Block. Uh, so how are you doing today, Nicholas? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Nice. Well, we're super, super happy to, to have you here. Uh, and today, I guess I want to start off with a question uh, just to get an idea of, uh, you know, the man behind it all. Uh, I, I, I saw because I was I was listening, I think it was last week to a podcast of yours that's fairly recent with Stefan Rivera. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you were talking at the beginning about like your work as a software engineer. Uh, but I also saw, because I was, I was looking, you know, uh, at different websites and Twitter and things, and I saw that you were a martial arts coach and diver as well, which sounds pretty exciting. Um, but I was thinking to myself, like, hey, how how is that? Because obviously software engineer, martial arts guy and diver, like three pretty different spheres. So I was, I was wondering, I don't know, if you could like give me a bit of an understanding of the story of like how those worlds blended together and, and kind of how you ended up doing all those different things. It just sounded like an interesting story to me. Well... <clears throat> If you watch The Matrix, which I'm sure you've heard of, there's quite a few parallels between being a software engineer and a martial artist. So, but yeah, <laughs> I was just a hobbyist. You know, when I was young, I used to travel a bit. I used to work a bit, backpack. Um, I got into martial arts really just because it was a way of training with other people and staying fit. I was never into uh, just going to a gym and lifting something. And it, it was really a different avenue of meeting people. And it just so happened I am, um, I did it for quite a while and then I, I moved to New York through work in 2010 and you know I just ended up teaching there because the, the, the thing that the, the type I was doing wasn't well known in the US and it was really just a hobby and it was a great way to, to meet people in the US like outside of like you know the kind of software engineering work sphere and that's it really to be honest but I, I guess I did a, a reality TV show once or I think some YouTube thing in New York and it kind of blew up there was this uh, Irish boxer who went around the US challenging, I guess, Kung Fu people. And I didn't take it seriously at the time. I said, yeah, let's meet. And before I knew it, I was on the YouTube show and he became a good friend. And yeah, I guess I, through that, I started teaching quite a lot. But it's 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 just a, a bit of fun. I mean, I don't teach anything anymore. I mean, I do for fun. I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But you know, that's just as a hobbyist. You know, keeps me sane, keeps me in shape. And that's, that's it, really. <laughs> Sorry, nothing more... Uh, Nothing more special than that. Well, no, I'd, I'd say, I don't know, it sounds kind of interesting and like unexciting to a degree. So like, obviously, because you, you, you said, is it BJJ that you were into at the time? And then when you no, went not to- Not at the time, I no. am now. So, you know, right. <clears throat> MMA is big now, but then it was kind of transitioning. And then yeah, just through people I knew, I started going to MMA schools. And I really, recently, I really fall for BJJ. I like it. And I'm getting a bit older. So at a certain point in life, you can't get punched in the head anymore, you know, can punch and hurt. <laughs> especially if you're a software engineer, you need to think. Jiu-Jitsu, I'm not saying Jiu-Jitsu is not tough, it, it is obviously, but you can train at a high level without, you know, getting concussion. You can always tap. So if someone's trying to choke you, if someone's trying to pull your arm out of your shoulder, you can always tap. So it's a great way to train, I think, as you get older without risking concussion and injuries, because you can tap. I mean. I still get injured in jiu-jitsu, but you know, it's normally because I haven't tapped quick enough or I haven't warmed up. It's, I don't have to worry about you know, teeth. Well, you can have your teeth knocked out, but I don't have to worry about blows to the head and things like that. But yeah, that's that's probably why I describe jiu-jitsu for me. I get that. It's uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying because I think from like uh, my understanding, I've got friends who do uh, jujitsu and, and and other martial arts, and they were saying like um, it's like if you're a smaller person, you can use like a, a different vantage points and grapples and things to like avoid getting into rough situations. And yeah, they were saying you avoid a lot more unnecessary combat. I guess is the way they put it. So well, there's, there's no strikes in jujitsu. So mm. and if you look at the original UFC days, it's, it was weird. You had these kind of boxers, kickboxers, fighting these little jiu-jitsu guys who essentially just drag these guys to the ground and using leverage would pop their shoulder or, you know, try and choke them from the behind. And, you know, it's, it's, it is very engineering-like. So, you know, you know, if you Google jiu-jitsu, you will see a lot of big, you know, strong guys wrestling. Very scientific. It's very engineering. It's all about leverage. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of Bitcoiners are in it, funny enough. Um, the place I used to train in New York, um, Roger Baird used to have private lessons there. And uh, it was funny because... Um, he used to pay private lessons in Bitcoin 
And I never met him, but one day I was in the showers, as you do, with one of the coaches, and he was complaining about some Bitcoin guy who uh, screwed him, more or less, by paying for class in, in Bitcoin. And he didn't realize that this was probably 2015. He didn't realize how much that money actually was. So he literally, he knew I was working in tech. He knew I knew about Bitcoin. So he literally went on his uh, blockchain.com account. And I think his password was probably something like password or one, two, three. And then it turns out Roger Ver paid almost $30,000 for a lesson and the money was there. And suddenly this black, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt was like, wow, <laughs> couldn't believe it. So, so, you know, I think he was angry for a few years and ultimately was very happy. And this yeah. was in 2015, so I guess that's probably $400,000 now. So. Damn, that's that's amazing. Actually, that's kind of a cool story. Like, if a, if the jujitsu guy had like diamond hands, you know, he'd uh, he'd be sat there with you know potentially half a million or something. Quite a bit, he still uh, has right half now. of it. He he blew half of it on a surfing holiday, and uh, he still has. I still speak to him about that. So. <laughs> that's really cool. That's uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I didn't realize um, the connection. I guess it was, yeah, as you said, Roger Burns. I suppose. Um, yeah, I suppose basically what you're saying is you're basically Neo, really. I mean, you, you made it at the, the, the beginning of the, the, beginning of the podcast. Yeah, when, I, when I close my eyes and sleep, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, I like it. It's, um, I mean, I, 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 I'll move on slightly because I know I'm where the, you know, our audience isn't, isn't uh, uh, fighting and martial arts based. But it's just, I think it's really interesting just to, to understand that. And, and I guess that's a pretty cool story as well. Um, and it, it kind of, I've heard a lot of stories about people who didn't fully understand Bitcoin or whatever, being paid in it years ago or tipped in it or, or whatever. And then um, they just, you know, find out, oh, it's worth, you know, X amount. And they've made, you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. I, I love those kinds of stories. It's always, yeah. uh, it's always awesome to hear that. Nicholas, I, I don't want to change the subject on you, but um, what is Mercury Wallet? Like, I'm super interested to hear about your project that you're working on. Yeah, so it's a combination of things, but essentially um, a guy called Ruben um, Samson, he wrote... Um, he wrote a white paper, well, a medium verse about a concept called state chains. And essentially it's a way of moving private keys, which uh, at the time it came out, you know, Commerce Block had been around for three years. We'd been building side chains, but um, we'd used the same code base as, as Liquid, which is called Elements, and we built permission side chains. But in, in reality, we hadn't had much traction. That wasn't going too well. But so we were looking for other things to do in Bitcoin and, you know, just, that struck a few chords. You know, I think one of the things I liked about state chains is it, at the time it solved some of the scalability issues because you could move private keys off chain. So you're not touching the Bitcoin blockchain. And, you know, a, a lot of Bitcoiners always say, is it not your keys, not your coins. I like the fact that this kind of <laughs> changes that a bit because now you're moving your private keys around. And um, some of his writings at the time, you know, it wouldn't have been possible to build state chains at the time because it it relied on some changes to Bitcoin, the predominantly L2. But my co-founder, you know, he worked with our team to basically come up with a way using these kind of time locks to kind of get out of that. And also at the same time, um, I think Chris Belcher started looking at the coin swap idea and uh, he, he'd written a, uh, some stuff on, on the Bitcoin mailing list. And, you know, we didn't just want to build state chains because, you know, we are a business, we are you know, we need to make money. So we thought, why not combine, you know, kind of coin swaps with state chains to provide a kind of a new privacy technique for Bitcoin. We, we've been doing bits on privacy anyway. You know, when you're working on uh, side chains, we, we've been using the elements code base, which had confidential transactions. So we've been toying about privacy anyway. And because we work with a lot of institutions, you know, believe it or not, privacy is not just for dark markets. Institutions want privacy. We want Bitcoin to be as private as the existing financial system. So we felt by, you know, kind of combining state chains and coin swaps, we'd basically provide a new privacy tool for Bitcoin, which had some, you know, scaling um, benefits because you could move Bitcoin off chain. And, you know, the, the privacy element also becomes quite cheap because you're, you're doing swaps off chain. Because at the moment, most you know, privacy techniques are quite expensive in terms of, you know, there's a lot of on-chain transactions that go on. And, which now in our world becomes state coin. We use coin swap to, you know, to basically pass them around to swap them so that you can basically lose your history or you know, transfer your history and create a kind of like a, a privacy layer. So, and you know, Mercury, which you know, we're still in beta, but you know, we released our beta for um, I think it's about six weeks now. We have some users. That's essentially what it does. It allows Bitcoin to be kind of moved into these state coins. And then in, there's a, a, a coin swap tool that allows like, people to basically meet and swap their coins. And, you know, the whole protocol is private. It's you know, the, 
the, the coin swap protocol itself is uses kind of like is blinded. Yeah, so I think, so what we do is the wallet allows um, us to take in Bitcoin and convert them into stake coins, which stake coins are essentially just the Bitcoin U UTXO. Um, so, and by using the coin swap uh, protocol, we're able to swap them blindly with other participants. So essentially as a user, you can come in, you create a stake coin by depositing some Bitcoin and essentially you go to this, you use the swap feature to basically exchange or swap your Bitcoin or stake coins with other users. Now, some of the limitations here is these, these are UTXO based, so they're fixed denominations. So you can only, you know, a stake coin will say have one Bitcoin or point one Bitcoin, it stays that. You, we can't break it, it's not divisible like Lightning. It's, it's not suited for small payments. It's essentially taking Bitcoin addresses or UTXOs and facilitating moving them off chain. So I, I guess the um, the thought that comes to mind understanding that is, um, I guess, as you say, it's not not like uh, as useful for, for for quick, small commerce, like buying a coffee or something as, as Lightning would be. Um, but then obviously Lightning has the drawback of, you know, needing lots of liquidity tied up and things like that. Um, it, what's the... I guess what's the demand and the fees when it comes to to, to utilizing um, state chains and 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 coin swaps? Yeah, so because these are UTXOs and because they're, they're, they're blinded, we can't charge for swaps anyway. So, so there is a fee when when you leave the system. So if you come in, you deposit your coins, uh, you can swap as much as you want for as long as you can. And well, when I say as long as you can, we we do have these things time locked. At the moment, we've set that to three months. So you know, but in that period, you can swap as much as you can. And then when you come out, we take a fee of 0.5%. So, but that's unlimited swaps and, you know, and you're free and that coin can be transferred. You know, every time it's transferred, I think there's a decrementing time lock. So, and the reason we've done that is there is a risk that a previous owner could basically steal your funds. However, what we did, we used this time lock sequence that can only happen after that three month period. So say, for example, um, so, you know, one of the things is, are we custodial or not? Uh, we're not custodial in that, you know, if we get shut down, there's, there's no funds that can be seized. We have no access to the funds, but there is that risk that a previous owner could basically broadcast an existing transaction and, and take the funds. And, and that, that issue exists in Lightning. I mean, a few, in, a previous owner of Lightning could do that as well. Now, Lightning, I think, solves that by having punishment transactions and watchtowers. The way we solve it is we basically set the backup transactions to have a kind of a three month limit so in that three months you're you you're you should feel it's impossible for a previous owner to steal the funds so so long as you behave stay in the state coin system for that three months that risk doesn't exist so say for example uh, mercury was to, to vanish let's just say that the, the server blows up or we get shut down you always have a backup transaction to broadcast the bitcoin network to, to take your funds but that backup transaction would only be accepted by the bitcoin network once that three month limit is, is, is eclipsed. Okay, gotcha. So I suppose um, when I'm thinking of things to compare it to, um, I, I suppose obviously it's, it's a, I'm, under, I'm right in understanding it's a layer two rather than a side chain, right? So that would be more like lightning in a way uh, than liquid. But then I feel like the competing, the competing sort of the, the use case almost is more of like competing with liquid, I would, I would say, but like maybe a more private version. I, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just kind of making sort of assumptions. But from what you're saying, yeah. you can understand that feels like what it is. It's like, Oh, it's somewhere sorry. in between because obviously i mean it doesn't have the liquidity inefficiency of liquid i mean there, there doesn't need to be any capital locked up but also you know you're, you're stuck with fixed denominations uh, so obviously like sorry lightning is good for micro payments but it, it's kind of very inefficient from a, a liquidity point of view i mean i wouldn't say we compete with a side chain because a side chain um i mean when it comes to custodiality you know side chain is kind of custodian i mean you are relying on the kind of like the uh, federation, the federation could, in theory, seize your funds. Also, um, all transactions are recorded on the side chain. Even if you're using confidential transactions, you do have a, uh, a ledger here. With a state chain, you know, you're not, you know, transactions are essentially blind. I mean, they happen off chain. We do record them, but, you know, these are all public. But, you know, there's no, also from a custodial point of view, we don't have custody. So, but, you know, there is an attack vector that I mentioned of the previous owners being able to steal the funds. So 
yeah, it's kind of hard to compare. I mean, there's a lot of noise on Twitter about kind of having lightning work on top of state chains, which, you know, we, we are looking at doing, but you know, I can imagine that's quite, there's a lot of complexity because essentially we're moving private keys. So to think of it, those private keys could be lightning channels. Now, obviously there's a lot of challenge there if, uh, with lightning, but a lot of people would like to see state chains merged into lightning, uh, lightning for that reason. So you could basically go from your kind of like coins, your Bitcoin to lightning kind of seamlessly via state chain. But um, yeah, we're quite well, far away from building something like that. <laughs> Nicholas, to me, it kind of sounds like Mercury functions um, in a similar way to the coordinator in Wasabi Wallet when you do the coin joins. Yeah, when we do the you, coin you're grouped stuff. with a bunch of other people and and um obviously like it's a state chain thing so yeah. it's different than wasabi but like are you make like when you use mercury do you mix with like hundreds of other people or like 50 other people or how does Correct. that work so we have if you open the wallet the first thing you do is you deposit your coins and you create your state coins and we then we do have a swap function which works very much like a, a wasabi coordinator I mean, the best way I think to think of state chains or state coins is virtual open dimes. That's essentially what they are. Uh, someone coined that the other day, but you know, remember the open dimes, you know, those kind of USB sticks where you can put Bitcoin in. That's what these things are, they're virtual ones. Yeah, that's probably the best of analogy I can think of to describe it. So our coin swap is essentially putting all these uh, uh, open dimes in a jar, shaking it and pulling a different one out. That's it. Excellent analogy. Thanks. That yeah. like, really helps me understand it. <laughs> yeah, I think that does. Yeah. I, I struggle to explain it because, you know, I, I work in the weeds with it all the time, so it feels normal to me. But when I explain it to people who, you know, are thinking like, you know, we're, we're basically virtual open dimes. You know, open dimes have got fixed amounts. Obviously, you can't change them. They are private keys, essentially. And, yeah, they, they live in this kind of virtual world now which is you know, what we call the Mercury wallet. With like other privacy wallets, like Wasabi, for example, they, people also want to see it like go from a coin join into lightning channels and stuff like that. So it would be super interesting um, if Mercury could also do that. That's on our roadmap. So I think we, I mean, look, there's various ways we could integrate lightning. What the complex way and probably the most interesting way is that these state coins represent a lightning channel. But I think that there's a, you know, we've spoken to some of the lightning devs, that's probably a, uh, you know, a lot of engineering and we're not sure of the use case and there's a lot of complexity there. But I think in the short term, what we would like to do is when people do withdraw, uh, they could potentially withdraw to a lightning channel. That would be our first kind of integration with lightning. And I think after that, potentially we would take the fee as a lightning payment. So at the moment people deposit their coins and you know they can swap they can send them to other people and then as they once they withdraw back to bitcoin a fee is taken i think a nice feature would be to just take a lightning payment up front to basically create the state coin and then you deposit your bitcoin into it and in theory that would leave less on-chain tate potentially you know we could do things where if people pay a bit more they get more state coins and probably reduce the fees as well and i think that would for us would give us a nice opportunity to kind of integrate lightning slowly into the wallet as opposed to the, the big bang approach of having state coins represent lightning channels and Bitcoin, which you can imagine there's quite a lot of complexity there. Am I, I, I might be, I'm going to make an assumption when I ask you this question. Uh, first, actually, if you could answer just to tell me, is, is Mercury Wallet a, a commerce block product or is it a separate thing that you're doing? I just wanted to be sure of that because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't it's check built, that. Out. It's built, the code's built by commerce block. It's run as a separate entity because obviously it has its own Sure, yeah, way of operating, but it's yeah, the whole team is at Commerce Block, yeah. and it's gotcha. all we're building, it's all we're working on, yeah. So, right, gotcha, okay, understood, thanks. Now, I just wanted to be sure of that because obviously, you know, I didn't want to make the assumption blindly. Um, so I guess, like, the, the something I wanted to ask because, um, I guess what, what, what you're doing is, is, is interesting work. It's obviously passionate based work and it's obviously privacy based to a degree as well with the, with the coins swaps. Um, and so I, I know on, on Stefan's podcast, like you were talking about at the beginning again, like how you discovered Bitcoin 2013, 2014 ended up creating commerce block 2016 ish. Um, I guess what I wanted to, uh, to understand, cause I know you guys did the side chain thing first and, and now you're working what you're working on, which is Mercury wallet and, and, and state chains. Um, I wanted to understand what the, the primary goal, I guess, is for commerce block. Like you, you obviously get to this point where you decided to create the company, um, 
why i guess like what and, and what is like, how has that changed and, and what is your overall goal i guess like i want to understand the overall goal of the company and of the team and of yourself and, and the people working with you um like why you're doing this because I, I guess it's always good to understand people's why um so that you can kind of better understand what they're creating yeah i guess originally we were looking at side chains and you know we wanted to build bitcoin infrastructure based on side chains and you know there's a lot of reasons why that hasn't worked out um a lot of it has to do you know, in 2019, we, we would speak to people about building on a, on a side chain. You know, people like EOS, if you remember them, Tezos, would, with their bags of cash, would make it more lucrative to work with others. I also think Bitcoin has changed. It's, you know, it's become a lot more ossified. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a hard environment to build, you know, kind of smart contracts on. And, you know, we just evolved. And, you know, you know, the team, you know, one of my colleagues are mainly Bitcoin guys. They know they know the infrastructure quite well. They know the Bitcoin scripting language quite well. And I think privacy was where I thought it was interesting. And, and, and we were doing privacy stuff on side chains anyway. And, you know, you know when I saw the state, state chain idea, it just felt very logical. There was a gap in the market. You know, privacy is quite hard on Bitcoin. Let's be, be clear, you know, Wasabi is not for everyone. Samurai is not for everyone. Join market is certainly not for everyone. I mean, join market is really interesting, but it's, it's, I wouldn't be able to show it to my mother, put it that way. So we thought, you know, if you look at the Mercury wallet, we hope we've created a wallet that's slightly easier to use than some of the other things. I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of myths about privacy. Probably people sometimes think privacy is a dark thing, but I just want Bitcoin to be as private as PayPal. <laughs> it's impossible for me to see your PayPal account. It should be the same. And I think a lot of people these days that I know don't even use Bitcoin because they, they don't really want to show their whole history when they go buy something with it. It's, it's, not, it's not ideal in that sense. And I think, and you know, funny, when I speak to institutions, which I do, because you know, I, I was a software engineer for banks. I worked on the trading floor. They, they're concerned about the privacy of Bitcoin. You know, they don't like the idea that Bitcoin sometimes is, is, is an open book. You know, you can see big trade flows or going in from exchanges to certain addresses. There are websites out there that can detect, you know, this address belongs to this guy or that belongs to that hedge fund or whatever. So I do think privacy is needed. Mm -hmm.